All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. So today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at a brand new TSX technology IPO company. So by brand new, I mean this company literally IPO'd in the past week, and it's called Copperleaf Technologies. So I have their chart pulled up here, and if we take a look, so this company was initially going to IPO for around $11 per share, and then they had a lot of demand, so then they increased that to $13 per share. And then they actually ended up IPOing for about $15 per share. And we can see here pretty much in their first day of trading, their shares got as high as almost $25 per share. So clearly there is a lot of excitement and a lot of interest in Copper Leaf Technologies. Now it's come down a bit kind of in the week following. You know, you usually expect that with an IPO, usually they aren't always so hot out of the gate. And then they stay at that level and definitely into the future, they typically cool off. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what happened. So what we're going to do today is explore this company a bit and see, is the hype really worth it? And is this company worth digging into a bit more and seeing if it's right for our portfolios? It's clearly a growth type company. It's an up and coming software company. So it's going to be interesting to learn about it. Now, what I have pulled up here is the slide deck that they used for their investor roadshow. So for those who aren't aware of what an investor roadshow is, it's really when a, before a company goes public, they do this thing where they travel around with investment bankers and they try to drum up interest in their stock. So really what it is, is it's a sales effort to sell the stock to potential investors. So when you read these investor decks, you really have to be mindful that they are trying to sell you on the company's shares. So make sure you read these things with a grain of salt. Obviously, when you take a look at these things, your conclusion is going to be, man, this company looks great. There's so many great reasons to invest in this company because that's the whole point of them. That's what they're trying to do. But I think it's good to go through it because it does have some important points in it that we can learn about this company. Now, Copperleaf Technologies is a decision analytics software platform for companies that deal in critical infrastructure. So there's a list of kind of the companies that they serve here, the, you know, the different industries. So there's uh, utilities, there's oil and gas, there's telecoms, there's many different types of companies that they serve, all dealing with critical infrastructure specifically. So it is actually quite niche. So it's all it is is just a software platform that these companies use to decide where to invest their money, which project should they take on? Should they invest in a new IT system that will save them operating expenditures, or should they you know, invest in this new electricity producing technology that could help say a utility company. That's the whole point. And they look at qualitative and quantitative aspects. So it's software, you know, that's really all it is. It's just a software platform. Now I'm not saying that to downplay them because there are plenty of companies out there that are just software platforms that went on to do amazing things. Salesforce, an example of that, they are just a software as a service company, but they do a lot. Um, they do about $4 billion in free cash flow a year, I think. So they are clearly a successful company. So it is definitely possible for companies that are just a software platform to become extremely successful. Now, they talk about many reasons why their platform is good. So I'm going to go to uh, page 15 here. They talk about some of the limitations that existing tools have. So this, what you're seeing here, is part of the whole sales effort, like I mentioned. They're really trying to show to you that there's a problem in this industry. We have the solution. And investing in our company is going to be great because we're going to be super successful in the future. But really what I'm interested in finding out in this investor slide deck is what they think their total addressable market is. Because like I said, this does seem like a pretty niche thing, you know, a software specifically for critical infrastructure companies. Um, so I want to find information on that. So if we go to page 20 or slide 26, they say here, they think that their total addressable market is about... 12 billion dollars now i was interested in figuring out how they actually calculated that number but i couldn't really find any information it really just seems like a number that they came up they didn't provide with specifics on how it's calculated so i am i'm not going to really use this number you know i'm going to be skeptical of it because i don't know how reliable it is and obviously what their motivation is is to inflate that number slightly to show that the market potential is rather big but what i do want to know and where i can get some you know kind of cold hard statistics on this company is in regards to customer retention. So I'm going to go to slide 38 and there's a lot of metrics that they provide here. So one I wanna direct your attention towards is this here, which they say they added 10 new clients, uh, I guess so far in 2021. So what that tells us is that confirms our belief this is a very niche company. I mean, only 10 new customers, but they did say that they have 62% revenue growth. So clearly, 
they're not serving that many customers, but the customers they are serving, they're very high value sales. I mean, they must be sales that are in hundreds of thousands or potentially even millions of dollars range. So the sales effort for this company is going to be probably pretty long. It's going to involve, you know, hiring a lot of sales staff and then doing a lot of follow-up and a lot of software testing and examples and demos for the company to show, you know, how their software can actually work for them. Now, another uh, interesting statistic is 100% client retention. So they do have a very small amount of customers. So that's not as impressive as a number as say a software as a service company that had thousands of customers and they had 100% client retention. That'd be a lot more difficult, but it's still good to see because that proves that the customers that are using them do find pretty significant value in what they provide and their software actually works, you know, which is clearly important. Now there's also this number here, which is net revenue retention rate. So you'll see a lot of software companies talk about this specifically young ones. And you want to see this ideally above hundred percent. Cause what that means is that they're upselling their customers because how it's calculated is they take their revenue per customer in the current year and then divide it by the revenue per customer for that same group of customers in the previous year. So if it's a hundred, that means it was the same, but if it increased, that means it's, um, they were able to upsell customers essentially. So that's a good sign to see. Okay. So now I've gone over to this company's prospectus. So a prospectus is a very long filing that all companies that want to go public have to issue. And it's ripe with information that will teach you all about the company and the market and what they do. So it's definitely a great read if you are interested in learning more about Copperleaf. But I went to this section here called differentiation. And what they're doing here is they're explaining why is their platform good? What makes it unique? And why is it going to be successful in the marketplace? And one thing I want to highlight is what they call the network effect here. Now, what they end up describing isn't really what I would consider a network effect, but I do think that it is actually pretty interesting to look at. So they talk about this thing that they call the Copperleaf Value Model Library. And what it is, it's basically just a bunch of best practices that they get throughout years of working with their clients. Um, and there are different models that companies can use when they're making decisions on their critical infrastructure. So the more companies that they have onto their platform, the more that they can build out this model library and the more valuable their software becomes. So that will likely attract, you know, future clients who want to use, who want access to this type of libraries and want to know what these best practices are. So this is definitely something that intrigued me a bit. And I wouldn't necessarily call this a an economic moat you know you often hear that term get thrown around because the company is so new they are still operating in a niche uh, environment you can't really say definitively that they have an economic moat yet just because it's way too early to tell but stuff like this is really what you want to look for kind of these early indicators that show that they are interested and they're thinking about ways that they can differentiate their platform and make it increasingly valuable into the future they're not just satisfied with how it is today and they think you know, what the platform is as it stands today is the be all end all and companies are just going to flock to it because it's just so amazing. They're thinking about how can it continually get better by adding more people to the network that they've called. Now, something else that I found interesting in their prospectus was I went way down so I'm on page 214 and let's focus on this part here. So they're talking about the per share price as of December 31st, 2019. Now, keep in mind, as of recording this video, uh, which we're currently in mid-October of 2021, their shares are about $21 per share, as we saw when we looked at the chart. But in December 31st of 2019, their shares, this is in USD, so if we're saying it's Canadian, probably about $4 per share. So that is a significant increase in this company's share price when it went from the private market onto the public markets where you know traders can buy and sell the stock on a day-to-day -day basis. So that just shows you know, how private investing, you can typically get a lot better deals because not a lot has really changed in this company from those two time periods. I mean, certainly not enough that it would warrant that exorbitant of a price appreciation in the shares, but it just goes to show that you can get pretty good deals when you're investing in these companies in private markets or private market investors. I mean, typical investors like you and I don't really have access to those types of markets, but it does show how much optimism is built into these companies as soon as they go public. And that was seen again when they IPO'd and their price just instantly shot up way higher than even the company thought after they had revised their price twice, went from 11 to 13, then to 15, and it still went higher than that.
Okay, so now let's just jump straight into the evaluation. So this spreadsheet I have here is a spreadsheet that I created and it's available for all the subscribers of this channel to use completely free of charge. Just head to the link in the description of this video and you can find a Google Sheets of this spreadsheet and you can use it for your own analysis. It comes with the EV EBITDA valuation model as well as a free cash flow based model that has a discounted cash flow model here. So if you want to value more mature companies that have free cash flow, you can use that as well. So for this company, because they are a unprofitable technology company or software company more specifically, I'm going to use the EV EBITDA uh, multiple of earnings approach. So this is the approach that I typically use for these companies that they don't have any earnings to really go off of. And it's a bit more of a difficult valuation to do because we're kind of trying to guess or accurately predict what certain metrics will be in the future. But if we just put in some baseline assumptions, we can generally get a pretty good idea of what we can expect this company to be worth about seven years out in the future. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm doing a seven year analysis. Now, as we previously discussed, there's a lot of reasons to like this company, but the fact is they're currently operating in a rather niche industry. And it's currently, as of making this video, it's about a $1.4 billion company in Canadian. And they do 60 million Canadian dollars in revenue currently, or just under 60 million. I believe it's about 58 million. So clearly this company has to grow and it has to grow a lot in order for that valuation to make sense. So the way we're going to approach this is we're going to start with the revenue. So the top line first, and then try and predict where this company will be in seven years in the future. We're not really going to focus on the short term, like what I think the stock price will be by the end of the year, because no one really knows the answer to that. We're taking a long-term approach and we're focusing on the end destination of this company. So based on what we know about it, you know, a few just key metrics we know and some things we know about the market, what can we expect their revenue to be in the future? And then what will their valuation reasonably be based off of that revenue? So I'm going to go to this sheet here and I just basically did some very simple calculations. So they're Revenue as of the filings that I read was about this much. So about 57.9 million. And we saw before they have 62 customers currently. So their current revenue per customer is just under $1 million. So like I said before, the sales effort is very significant for these companies because they are very large dollar sales. And when they onboard a client, they don't want them to leave. They want that client to stay on them, continue using the platform and also upsell them on additional services because that's really the goal of what they're doing. And then from there, I assumed how many new customers they would add each year. So I assumed it would increase because what they're probably gonna do with the funds they get from you know, going public is they're probably going to invest in a new sales force because that's a lot of that money is gonna to go towards growth, right? That's what these technology companies need to do. And that's what investors are looking at. They're looking at revenue growth more so than profit growth, which, you know, whether or not you agree with that approach is something else to be discussed, but that's the way it is currently in the market as it stands today. You know, revenue growth is very important. So I basically assumed that the adoption of this platform would increase as time goes on. So that is a, an assumption. I think it is a pretty optimistic assumption, but I don't think it's entirely unreasonable. So 15 new customers in 2022, 20, new customers in 2023, all the way up to 40 new customers. So then they have 227 new customers in 2027. And then I stick with the exact same revenue per customer. So then we get total revenue of 212 million in the year 2027. So they're going from 58 million now to 212 million in, in about, about six and a bit years. So that is significant growth. Now there are one catalyst I wanted to mentioned was that there is that very large uh, US infrastructure bill, I believe it's in the trillions, which some of that will probably trickle down into copper lead because remember they deal with critical infrastructure investments. So it's likely they will see some of that benefit probably indirectly. Again, that's very difficult to quantify, but it is one growth catalyst that I think is worth mentioning. And the customer adoption also has to increase, which I think is reasonable. Again, we talked about that network effect, but also just as they become more reputable and more companies sign on, um, it's reasonable to assume. And of course, they build out their sales force a bit more with you know the money that they get from going public. I think it is possible. Again, it's pretty optimistic, but it's within the range of what we could assume is reasonable. So some of the limitations to this is it does assume that there are no new services created by this company because the revenue per customer stays uniform throughout the entire time, which isn't going to happen. But what we're just trying to do here is get a ballpark estimate, right? We don't need it to be 100% perfect. We just want to get a general sense based on a few key inputs. 
So then we go back to this model. Now currently have the revenue growth at 10% a year, which assumes that in 2027, the revenue growth will be about 87 million. So that's probably too low. So let's revise it. Now, the way we can do this is Excel has a pretty interesting tool to kind of do this in a quicker way. So we go to the data tab here, go over here to the what if analysis, and we use goal seek, goal seeker as a lot of people call it. So we're going to set this cell to the value that we want, which we're dealing with thousands here. So 212,000 would be 212 million by changing cell, which would be the revenue growth rate. We hit okay. And then it does the calculation for us. And we go over here. It basically says our revenue growth rate needs to be just under 25% annually in order to hit this projection we built here of $212 million in revenue in 2027, um, which is what we basically did here. Now, other inputs that I have in here is the EBITDA margin I put at 35%. Again, that's pretty ballpark what you can expect for software as a service companies. Usually they'll be in the range of 40 to 35%. Of course, some are higher, of course, some are going to be lower, but typically they're going to be in that sort of range. Now, I wanted to go more conservative just to leave more potential upside in the model. So I just put 35%. And then a similar philosophy with the EV EBITDA multiple in 2027. Now, this is what it's going to be in 2027, not what it's going to be in two years. So this is after they realize all this revenue growth potential that we just projected they're going to have. So we're assuming they're still going to have an EV EBITDA multiple of 2025, which still is extremely growth dependent. So with this multiple, we're assuming additional revenue growth from here on out. So again, it's a rather optimistic assumption, but I mean, as we saw with the company's current valuation, we have to be optimistic for it to make sense. Now with their uh, debt, so debt you reduce or you deduct it out of the, uh, when you're calculating the market cap, you can see here, you basically calculate enterprise value based on that multiple we just talked about. You take out debt, you add the cash, and then you get what their estimated market cap will be. So I just, these don't affect the valuation that much. I just put in baseline assumptions. So they're a software company. They're not going to have very many debt or preferred shares and total cash. I put as a hundred million, which, you know, these don't affect the valuation that much. So don't spend too much time trying to perfect those and then shares outstanding. So this is another one that's very hard to project. Now their current shares outstanding were about 57 million. And I assume this is going to grow at 4% a year. So that assumes maybe they issue some shares to acquire a company, but also it assumes some dilution in the share ownership because um, of acquisitions as well. They could um, pursue a, an inorganic growth strategy, which they mentioned in their prospectus, that is something that they'd be open to do. You know, they're not one of those software companies that just says, we just want to grow organically. We just want to you know, increase our sales by selling to more customers. We don't want to acquire any companies. That's not what they're doing. They did say we're willing to acquire some companies at the right price. And if there's the right fit and all that. So some of it could be due to um, buying a new company and issuing shares in order to buy the company. They also have an employee stock ownership program because these tech companies, they have to have that. That's how they retain high level technology talent is by having, offering them uh, stock options in the company. So I just assumed 4%. Again, it's just an assumption. So let's see what the model ends up being with all that. So our average annual return is just under 3%. We're saying their price per share in 2027 will be 25.5 per share. And it's currently 21. Now, if you say you wanted a 10% annual return, then $13 a share would be how, what you would have to buy into, assuming all of these assumptions hold true, which again, obviously they won't, but we wanna put these assumptions in because it helps us think about their valuation and it helps us identify when is a good time to actually think about building a position in this company if we like it and what assumptions you know, does it take for the company to be a good investment. Now let's adjust these a bit to see what it actually takes. So let's assume their revenue grows even higher than we projected. So let's go 30%. And then let's change their EBITDA margins. So they're even more profitable than we expect. So that goes to 40%. Now we get an average annual return of 8.8%. So we want to see this more in the range of 12 to 15, because we want to invest in an individual company because we want to beat the market. You know, the TSX on average over long periods of time will give you about 10% return a year. So obviously if you're going to take the additional risk of investing in a new company specifically, you're going to want a higher expected annual return. So let's assume instead their revenue growth is 35%. Now it's more in the range of where it gets interesting. But then once you get to this point, you want to ask yourself, 
are these reasonable assumptions? Because now their revenue is $360 million in 2027, which that would really require them to blow it out. You know, they'll just have amazing growth to the future, which they could very well do, but it's so difficult to predict that future for such a young company that we don't really have that much information on that. You know, it's going to be hard to you know, sleep well at night knowing that it's going to take that in order for your investment to pay off like you would with about a 13% annual return. Okay, so now I want to talk about some of the optimism regarding technology companies that we've been seeing in the TSX specifically. And I do want to preface this part by saying that this is really just going to be my opinions alone. You know, you guys know that when I do this, I make these videos, I do my best to provide unbiased information on this channel. So definitely take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt. And there's a reason why I have light speed pulled up on their chart here. So I'll talk about that in a bit. But over the last 18 months, really since um, you know, the lockdown started, we've really seen a lot of technology companies really take off. And I've covered a lot of these technology companies on the TSX previously. For example, some to come to mind are Lightspeed, which I'm showing. Nuve is another one. Docebo is another one I talked about. So I've all, of all, all these companies I've covered, and these are companies where it really seems like their valuations are starting to stretch what can really be considered as reasonable, in my opinion. Now, it's easy to justify the valuations these companies have of being 25, 30, 35 times their sales right now because they are such young companies and they are in the growth phase. The revenue is growing and who knows what the future will hold for them. I mean, they could be the next Shopify for all you know, and you can't really go out and call them overvalued because if they do end up becoming the next Shopify, then you look pretty stupid. So I think because of that, there's a lot of people that are reluctant to be pessimistic towards these types of companies, but what the reality is, is eventually for all these growth style technology companies, eventually a day of reckoning will come where at some point their growth starts to slow down and investors will actually start to expect that they make some real profit and not just see revenue growth. So if we take Nuve, for example, okay, so here is Nuve and this is what their stock has done in the past year. So it's been, you know, pretty insane if you think about it. I mean, it went from here where it was around 55 a share and it just has kept on going up. And recently it's at around, well, got to as high as 178 per share. And now it's around 155 per share. So significant growth there. And what you got to understand about Nuve is, so it's an $18 billion company, billion in US dollars. And their revenue in the last 12 months is 537 million, again, in US dollars. So that is a 33 price to revenue multiple. That's not a price to earnings multiple. That's a price to revenue multiple. So clearly buying into that company at that valuation means the company has to grow and they have to grow fast. There's no question about it. A company like that has nothing but excellence priced into their valuation. And any hiccup to that could mean a sharp decline in the share price because investors may begin to get worried. And it's not just Nuve, it's a lot of these TSX tech stocks that we've been seeing. And we saw something like this happen recently with Lightspeed. If we go over here to Lightspeed. So this is again, a year chart. We can see very significant growth. And then it came down a lot. And I'm sure some of you guys know why there was that short seller report that got released on them. And all that short seller report did was just summarize some information that was available to every investor out there. You know, this was information that all these investors should have already known. And they basically said that, Lightspeed isn't growing as fast as they're leading investors to think they are. And that's all it took for this company to not necessarily tank, but a very, a very steep decline. So if you bought into this company, say around here, you're probably not feeling great because, you know, it just had a pretty significant drop. So what my concern is really is that there's just too much money chasing too little promising technology companies out there that are currently in their growth phase. And this could be leading to overvaluations. Now, it is possible that a few of these companies, so maybe the companies we talked about or other ones, will end up being great investments over the next five or 10 years, but not all of them will. And if all of these companies have sky high valuations, which is what it seems to be the case, in my opinion, based on what I've looked at, then it's more likely that what you're going to see with the vast majority of these companies is they just end up losing a lot of value or losing value slowly over time as investors begin to realize that what they were priced at previously is just not what was realistic for them. There was just too much growth there and you know investors didn't fully understand the market that they were in. And what's really amazing to me is how tolerant investors have become of 
companies that are just burning cash and losing money year in, year out, just over and over again. I mean, we see this with Spotify in the US markets, Uber. I mean, these are companies that are operating in very new industries that really don't have any proven business model in them. And they just continue to lose money and lose money. But investors just keep buying, buying into their shares. And, you know, I'm not saying this to try and be a doomsday predictor or anything. I just wanted to highlight it because it kind of reaffirmed this belief I had when I saw what happened with the Copperleaf IPO because their shares just went so high so fast, you know, and the company kept revising their estimate up and up and up. It just shows how much optimism there is and how there is potentially a risk that some of these companies are just way too overvalued right now. Again, I don't know what the future may hold, but it's just what I'm seeing. Okay, so that pretty much concludes what I wanted to talk about in this video, but I'll talk about some quick concluding thoughts in regards to Copperleaf. So, I mean, from what we've seen, they're, they're clearly offering a great product, right? The software is good, people like it, their clients continue to use it, but it just seems that there's so much optimism that's already baked into this company's stock price. Again, like we've seen with many technology companies that buying into their share price now is just very risky. You know, there's a lot of downside you could face if they just don't live up to expectations. And there is that risk because they are operating in such a niche market. And we don't know if it's going to require them to expand in the new markets. So just because there's so many unknowns, you really have to believe in this company and really think that the products that they're offering are extremely valuable and many companies are going to use them into the future. So that's just my thoughts. Again, thank you guys for listening to this video. I hope you did get a lot out of it, found it useful and educational. If you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate if you consider subscribing and like the video if you did enjoy it. And I'll see you in the next video.